The environment is a complicated issue. And for being q it's even more complex. Because it affects just about every part of our business. So, while it's easy to say that being q is going greener, actually doing it is much, much harder. But we do all need to get involved. Because one thing's for certain, there's no time to lose. Hello. As B&Q Chief Executive Jim Hodkinson has just pointed out, when it comes to environmental issues, there really is no time to lose. If we want our children to inherit a world worth living in, a world where plant and animal life can thrive, a world where the air is clean and the water's drinkable, we all have to act, and we have to act now. Now, I can imagine you're thinking, that's all very well, but surely b and a business, not a conservation charity. How can a chain of DIY stores save the planet? Well, the honest answer is, of course, it can't, not on its own. But it can set an example. It can make a difference. And in this program, we're going to be looking at some of the ways you can help it to make that difference. There's no doubt that environmental concerns are beginning to shape businesses everywhere. And even if there are still some grown-ups who need to be convinced, your customers of the future don't have any doubts. The oceans are rising, the rainforest killing off the wildlife, people dumping litter, the ozone layer, skin cancer, far too much packaging, the number of cars on the road. Still people are using as much petrol and things, if not more. I and mean, we'll have nothing else to use except nuclear power, which is too dangerous. People dump things in the sea and they think it's not their problem anymore and it's just going to wash up on someone else's shore. But in the meantime, all there's millions of animals get killed every day. School children are learning more about it than adults. We're the next generation. We're the ones that will have to suffer. We will have the knowledge, hopefully to be able to do something about it. Get rid of all the fumes, refreeze the polar ice caps and fix the ozone layer. We should be thinking more about recycling. There's plenty of waste paper everywhere. There could even be a cure for AIDS that we don't know about in the rainforest, and that might be lost if we cut them down. They could make adverts like saying, well, we don't test on animals and we're all ozone friendly. Like being cute, they're going to try and go all ozone friendly. So they could make an advert because then more people might shop there. Um, I'd definitely go to B&Q as long as they make it known because that's one of the problems these days and half of the people aren't aware of what's happening to the world so I think we should be like more advertising and everything. Get the message around that we've got to do something about it now before it's too bad. If they don't do mm -hmm. anything now, the future's going to get worse and worse. If everyone kept doing the same way of making their products, the world would just be in so much trouble that even if we could work out a way to stop it, it, wouldn't, it would be too late. But if some... Um, large chain stills and stuff, such like, are actually starting now. The message will get across to the other ones and the damage will be slowed. Of course, children aren't really the only ones concerned. There are plenty of grown-ups, B&Q staff included, who have equally strong feelings when it comes to green issues. Every bowl of water we use, washing up and whatnot, it all goes in buckets and up in the garden. I have a green car, lead-free petrol. I use roll-on deodorants instead of spray deodorants. Ozone-friendly sprays. My car's fitted with a catalytic converter. I mean, what else can you do? Being cured, bringing in the products, they're bringing out a lot of brochures, etc., telling people about the environment, explaining in detail what the environment is. They're taking products now from places which are controlled. They're taking their product from places which are of no use, and they're leaving the places which is causing problems, like the marshes where you get your Levingtons from. We don't do Levingtons anymore. We've obviously kept the old one, but we've got the new Peat Free one, which is picking up. I would say now there's like maybe two out of every 10 customers are just lifting it. And uh, maybe the third person out of every 10 is looking at it, asking questions, what it's about and what it's for. And you tell them and they tell somebody else and everybody's going to find it. Oh, I'll go for Peat Free then. Looking at television and different things that are said, I better change, I think, to something like this. I think being q are heading in the right direction. Hopefully it's a trend that's going to increase. It's uh, one small part of a huge jigsaw which has got to fit together to make a whole picture. All the natural things, all the fossil fuels are going and the peat bogs are going, the rainforest is going, soon there'll be nothing left. So we've got to think about it, haven't we? It's in our, in our own interests and 
and that of future generations. It's most important, I think. Green issues and the environment, that's a huge, complicated subject. So what exactly are the key issues so far as B&Q is concerned? Well, of course, every aspect of the business is affected. But if B&Q is going to set a lead, then there are two issues that immediately spring to mind, timber and peat. B&Q sells tens of millions of pounds worth of timber products every year. And a lot of them are imported from the tropics. Plywood from Indonesia and ramen from Malaysia are two examples. But on top of those, there's plenty of other wood used as part of products. Things like loo seats, brush handles, garden tubs, curtain poles, doorknobs. Even wood chip wallpaper can have bits of imported timber in it. However you look at it, we're talking about an awful lot of trees. And of course, what B&Q uses is only a minute fraction of the timber that's cut down for commercial purposes every year. Most people are aware of the damage to tropical rainforests, but there are similar problems in other parts of the world too, in Canada and the States, for instance. To give us a better idea of the scale of the problem, here in the studio is Francis Sullivan, Forest Conservation Officer for the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Francis, why do we need to conserve the world's forests? The world's forests simply protect life on Earth. If they're stripped away, that life is jeopardised. We need those forests at the local level for producing agricultural goods, for producing clean water for us to drink. At the international level, we also need them because they stabilise climate and because they harbour so many important wildlife species which we all need. And how fast are they being destroyed? Well, sadly, they're being destroyed at roughly 20 million hectares a year. That's an area the size of England, and it simply means that in a lifetime, they're going to be simply snuffed out. And as I understand it, over half the world's population live in and around tropical rainforests. And that figure's going to rise dramatically in the future. What's this loss going to mean to them? Well, as the forest is stripped away, it has a number of effects on the people that live in and around the forests. The first is that their water supplies start to simply dry up. Rivers that once flowed all year move into a cycle of drought and then flood. Climate starts to change, which affects their farming systems, and the wealth of plant and animal species which people used to be able to take from the forest simply disappear. It's not just a, a problem that we can partition as something in the tropics thousands of miles away. When forests are destroyed, an enormous amount of carbon dioxide is liberated into the atmosphere. This is contributing to the greenhouse effect and it means that sea level is starting to rise and once predictable climate is changing forever. Now surely it can't just be the timber trade that's causing all these problems. Well, we're not saying that it's just the timber trade, but perhaps 25% of the damage is being caused by the careless extraction of timber. What we're saying is that we have to stand up to our individual responsibilities here. If the timber trade is responsible, they've got to get their act together and do it soon. So what we're saying is, act now, we haven't got time to waste. So what's WWF recommending that they actually do? We're saying that within the timber trade, it must be based on sustainable supplies of timber in a very short time frame, by the end of 1995. That's our target date. Now, sustainable, everybody talks about sustainable. What does that really mean? Well, by sustainable, we mean that the timber has to be extracted from the forests in a way that doesn't destroy the forests, it doesn't destroy the wealth of wildlife within those forests, or upset the local people living in and around them. Otherwise, it just means that over time, the forests are being eroded and the local people are being kicked out. But does anybody really know how to manage forests in that kind of way? Well, there are a few promising pilot projects around the world. Those are the ones we want to encourage. And of course, the other side of the coin is we want to discourage the majority of projects which simply mine the forest rather than managing it properly. Francis, thanks very much. Thank you. But it isn't just B&Q's trade in timber that has an effect on the environment. In one way or another, all manufactured goods have an environmental trade-off. Even a seemingly innocent natural product like peat. Because when you sell potting compost and grow bags, or even potted plants, you can be contributing to the destruction of peat bogs. Now, on the face of it, even I have to admit that bogs don't perhaps have quite the romantic appeal of a tropical rainforest. So would it really matter if they disappeared altogether? Well, the answer is yes, it would matter enormously. 
But don't just take my word for it. Here's Caroline Steele from the Royal Society for Nature Conservation. Hello, Caroline. Why are our peat bogs so important? Well, they're this country's equivalent of the tropical rainforests. They're home to plants and animals that can't live anywhere else. On one bog, you could find 3,000 different types of animals. And there are rare birds, dragonflies, and fascinating plants, such as ones that eat insects. They're the best record that we have of ancient history. They haven't changed much since prehistoric man was here, and his remains can be found in bogs, along with records of how our climate has changed over the last five or 10,000 years, and what plants used to grow around bogs all that time ago. And globally, they're important too, because peat is basically carbon. And when bogs dry out, once the digging has started, the carbon is changed into carbon dioxide, and that contributes to global warming. Well, if they're that critically important, surely they must be really well protected anyway. Many of them are designated as sites of special scientific interest because they're so important. Some of them are internationally important, part of our heritage, a bit like Westminster Abbey, but uh, they're being destroyed just to sprinkle on the garden. So how bad is the problem? It's very bad. Uh, everybody knows that tropical rainforests are disappearing, but not so many people realise that we've already lost a much greater proportion of our lowland peat bogs. And how long does it take for a peat bog to recover? We don't know, but it's going to be thousands of years uh, before they get back to their original state. Well, that's all very well, but I mean, gardeners do need peat. They can't manage without it, can they? They can. There are plenty of alternatives available, and they're just as good as peat. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. So far, we've taken a look at two important environmental problem areas, areas which are directly affected by the demands of the DIY market. So what exactly is B&Q doing about it? Well, one of the first things the company did was to appoint a full-time environmental specialist, Dr Alan Knight. Alan, how committed is B&Q to dealing with these environmental issues? B&Q is very committed to dealing with these issues. Every single board meeting starts off with an hour's presentation on an environmental issue. And over the last year, we have developed a detailed environmental policy and a five-year action plan to implement that policy. And what's your feeling about the real commitment of the directors? The directors are personally committed. I know they are, because they keep on ringing me up and asking me some advice on a particular issue which affects their department. So what's happened so far? I mean, let's take timber for a start. Well, B&Q has committed itself to WWF's target of 1995. We were the first retailer to do this. That's really a very bold move, isn't it? So how have you gone about it? I met suppliers, trade associations and, of course, environmental organisations. And I even spent a month out in the Far East looking at the forest to see for myself exactly what was going on. It is impressive to see B&Q taking such a direct interest in the tropical timber trade. And Jim Hodkinson and Bill Whiting have been out to Malaysia to see the forest for themselves and to find out what really is happening, lucky things. Once you'd seen the situation out there for yourself on the ground, what kind of conclusion did you come to? There's nothing actually wrong in cutting trees down to supply timber, as long as that timber comes from well-managed forests. What we can do is use our massive purchasing power to influence the industry to source our timber from well-managed, sustainable sources. That's all very impressive, but mm. what about environmental issues a bit nearer home? We were hearing earlier on that our peat bogs are under serious threat, so what's B&Q doing about that? Last August, we made the decision not to buy peat, which had been dug from sites of special scientific interest. Well, that's a, a marvellous decision mm. from an environmental point of view, but surely it's going to mean you'll lose customers. No, because we're going to gain new customers, because we've got new products. We now stock peat-free own label potting composts, peat-free grow bags, and of course the new Horizon. Well, clearly b and is going about things in the right kind of way, but timber and peat are only a small part of your total turnover. As I understand it, you run something like 25,000 different yep. lines from 450 different suppliers. How's your environmental policy affecting all of those people? Our environmental policy affects all our suppliers. All our suppliers now have to have an environmental policy similar to our own. And we, we launched this policy 
at our suppliers conference in December of last year. The green issue will not go away. The tide of green concern may well ebb and flow, but each time it will rise to a new and higher ambient level. That's a clear lesson from around the world. The environment, after all, isn't just an airy-fairy thing for discussion by academics on the Channel 4 Late Show. It is the real world of businesses, the here and the now. The central part of B&Q's policy is that we ensure we know as much as possible about the environmental impact of the products we sell. This means that not only must B&Q have a clear environment policy and a thorough environmental audit of its own business practice, but we must also ensure that our suppliers too have a clear statement of corporate principles and objectives backed up by an environmental audit. They mean, first, that you will be required to run a cleaner business. And second, that if you don't do it when it is possible, someone else will. Tough talk from the top, but mm. what are you actually doing to back all of that up? All our suppliers now have to fill in a detailed 40-page environmental questionnaire. I have a team of environmental consultants who will analyse each individual supplier's performance. I've budgeted for over 100 site visits, where the same consultants will actually visit the factories of our suppliers. Any supplier who's just clearly not committed to environmental improvement will be delisted. Really? I mean, you'll mm. just not buy from yep. them? I'm sure they're loving that idea. What's been the reaction so far? The reaction has been very positive. Many, many suppliers are really supportive of what we're doing. Last week, I had a meeting with Ken Partington. He's the marketing director of Kalon. Ken, Kalon have an exceedingly good environmental record. How did this come about? It came about really for sound commercial reasons. We're in business to make a profit, and there is profit to be made. There is competitive advantage to be gained by investing in the environment and in environmentally responsible products. So your environmental initiative started a long time ago? Yes, it goes back to the early 70s when we were amongst the first to eliminate lead from all our paint products. More recently, in the early 1980s, we got rid of Lindane and TBTO from our uh, wood solvent-based preservative products. We were also, together with B&Q, amongst the first to introduce a low solvent gloss product, that's Gloss Plus, in 1989. And with B&Q's help, that was two years ahead of the brand leader. More recently, we've also uh, invested in a timber care product, which is a water-based alternative to conventional solvent-based wood protection products such as creosote. Has the B&Q supply audit helped? Yes, it has. It's been an enormous boost to us. We've been trying to get this message across for some time to our suppliers and to the market. And the fact that you're involved as well strengthens our stance. People now have really got to sit up and take notice. So you're doing your own suppliers audit? Yes, we're doing a supplier audit of all our raw materials. And the next on the list will be to carry out an audit of all our suppliers of our packaging material. Items like metal, plastic, cardboard, glass. We're making them pay attention to the environment. We're making demands upon them and we're asking them to make the same demands upon their suppliers and right on, right up through the supply network. We're saying to them, the environment makes good, sound, commercial sense. But underpinning that, it also makes good sense for our future and the future of our children and their children. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. It must be very heartening to get that mm, kind of very is, positive yeah. response back so quickly. Now let's move on to another of those key environmental issues, packaging. Well firstly, packaging plays a vital role in our business. If we had no packaging, our stores would be three times as big. Why? I don't understand that. Because packaging allows for us to space products out and keep the stores tidy. So what are the other advantages then? They also reduce shrinkage, they make stealing more difficult, they protect the product as well. There's nothing more environmentally wasteful than a damaged product which can never be used or will never work. So you're just accepting packaging as a fact of life then? 
No, we can make improvements. What we're telling our buyers and suppliers to do when they're designing packaging is to ask four simple but basic questions. Do I actually need packaging? There are examples where we don't need packaging. If I do need packaging, can I actually make my package smaller? Can I use recycled materials in my packaging? And is my packaging recyclable? And are you getting a good response from people? Yes, a very good response. We're, all, we're already beginning to see packaging change in our store. A foot pump, which we used to sell in a box, no longer comes in a box. Terrific. Now, I know from my own visits to B&Q that you sell a massive mm. amount of paint. And all that kind of inch and a half sludge in the bottom of the mm. tins of all your customers finishes up as a massive toxic waste problem going into landfill size. Are you able to do anything about that kind of problem? Yeah, what we have to do is to make sure that paint doesn't end up in a landfill site. So what we're doing in Leeds, our Killingbeck store, is we're doing a trial whereby we're offering facilities for customers to bring back that unused paint. It is possible that we might be able to reuse that paint for community projects or some other charity work. And are you doing that all on your own? No, we're doing it with Leeds City Council and ICI, who make the Dulux paint. Schemes like that are obviously very expensive. I must say, I'm pretty impressed by the amount of money that B&Q seem to be prepared to invest in environmental projects. Investments like that are good for the environment, but they're also vital if our business is to thrive. Oh, so we're not just talking about great, generous acts of charity here. We're actually talking about the bottom line, about profitability in the end. Yes. Good environmental management is good business management. Our customers are looking for retailers who take the environment seriously. The government are looking for businesses to take the environment seriously. If we ignore some environmental legislation, we might face a huge fine. Our shareholders are demanding that we take the environment more seriously. And all these actions will make B&Q a better place to work in. OK, well, let's talk about the people who work at B&Q for a minute, because this is a very ambitious policy. In the end, it's only going to work if you can actually get enthusiastic support from all of the staff. So how are you going to manage that? You're absolutely right. All our staff have to get involved. They're going to get posters. The store managers are going to get a manual which explains how to implement the environmental policy in their stores. We're going to have quarterly newsletters and we're going to have our green competition. And in the end, what's the basic message that you want to get across to people in B&Q? I want all our staff to get involved in implementing our environmental policies. It will make B&Q an even more successful and profitable company. Thanks, Alan. Well, we've talked to environmentalists, we've heard what some of the problems are, and we've heard from Alan Knight how B&Q is making a long-term commitment to environmentally friendly policies. But some of the problems can't wait. They have to be dealt with now. And waste disposal is one of the worst because now there are tough new government rules being introduced. Duty of care legislation, it's called, and it applies to any kind of commercial activity that creates waste. Well, that certainly includes DIY retailing. To see how b and is coping with this new legislation, and to learn a bit more about that new competition Alan mentioned, we're going over to the Stockport store to meet Peter Monaghan, b and qs operations director. First, let me ask a simple question. How come this load of rubbish cost £2,000? Simply, that's a fine B&Q would have to pay if an employee disposed of waste in an improper manner. The fine could be higher, and the resulting prosecution would seriously damage our reputation. So, what can we do about it? We can follow some simple but very important rules. We must segregate our waste in separate containers and ensure it doesn't blow away, spill, corrode, or leak. Obviously, this is very important as far as hazardous waste is concerned. But the most significant change is that we must separate out our hazardous waste from our normal waste. Here in Stockport store, we've been trialling a new way of doing that. Dave Garrett's the man in charge. When a spillage occurs in the store, we wheel out our dedicated trolley. This contains everything necessary in order to control the substances, keeping them safely separated and stored. The disposal of hazardous waste is company policy. We're actually serious about it. We're not paying lip service to it. I expect you all to get behind it and make it work. I know you can. So. I'm sure you want to find out more about B&Q's environmental policy. It's all contained in the store manager's guidelines folder. 
we cover the recycling of waste, energy management and conservation generally. Please read it and get behind it. Now, I've told you a lot about what I expect you to do. How about you? I'm sure you've got some great ideas how you can help the environment and help B&Q. So, we're launching a new competition called the Bright Green Ideas Competition. Let's hear your ideas about B&Q and the environment. And who knows, perhaps you win a prize. Thanks very much. Peter Monaghan there in Stockport, giving us plenty to think about, especially that duty of care business. Remember, that's the law already, a law that every B&Q employee must abide by. But as far as b and is concerned, it's only part of the picture. Environmental issues are at the top of the agenda throughout the company now. That's quite a challenge. It means you can't relax for a minute, and it means there has to be practical, positive support from everyone in the company, from stockroom to distribution centre, from office to waste disposal area, and from shop floor to boardroom. When we consider the environmental issue, we need to look at all the factors. There are ethical and moral aspects. There are questions of business cost and profitability. And there are many practical uncertainties because we're dealing with a whole new science, a whole new business discipline, which has to take into account the products we sell and the way our suppliers make them, the design of our stores and the way we run them, the views of our customers, our staff and our shareholders, and the way we react to them. To deal with matters of such scope and importance, it is essential first and foremost that every B&Q director understands the issues and has a personal commitment to tackling them. We have that commitment and we have spent the best part of two years planning the various initiatives that are now taking place. Now that we have developed that strategy, we're involving you. My vision is that of a B&Q that not only continues to be a healthy, fast-growing business, but a business that also impacts less and less on the environment. Creating a greener B&Q is an enormous challenge, and it is a challenge which cannot be met without your enthusiastic involvement. I believe that enthusiasm is there in abundance, waiting and wanting to be called upon, and I have no doubt that the success of the new Bright Green Idea Scheme will prove the point. We in B&Q can't save the world, but we can certainly do our bit. We can make a difference. As market leaders, we have a particular responsibility to give our industry a lead, and we are doing so with the supplier audit, for example, and with our important initiatives on peat and timber all of which have been moves which our competitors have quickly followed. Undoubtedly, we will have to face some difficult decisions. There will be conflicts. We won't always be able to change things as quickly as we'd like. But I am certain that the time to act is now, and we are doing so decisively. The Glittering Prize will be a better and more profitable B&Q, and a better, cleaner world for our children to inherit.